we go, round two. I can't believe it. Ugh. Nor, welcome to the podcast. Six years since our first one. You know, a lot has happened in those six years. A lot. But I'm glad we're still friends. I am too. <laughs> and I'm so glad that, yes, I want so much of what we're going to talk about is like, what has happened since then? How have we changed? Mm. What mm. has come? What has gone? What have we learned? Um, all of those things. You were episode 19 and we are at 260 something now. High five. So, that's crazy. Yeah, right? Wow. Congratulations. You've, that's, um, that's huge. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's truly been a wild ride. Uh, kicking and screaming, joy, sadness, anger, resolve, justice, all the stuff. The last six years have been absolutely, we, we, I mean, we met the first, the summer of Trump's first year in office. So much was happening. Wow. Um, so much has happened. I mean, insurrections and wars and Black Lives Matter and mm. <laughs> the pandemic. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Remember that? Forgot about that one. Remember that? Um, random about the pandemic. Yeah. How was that for you in particular? I was just reminiscing with a friend mm -hmm. and we look back, obviously year one, the s spring, summer, autumn, winter of 2020 was horrific in the lives lost, the yeah. people sick, uh, immune systems weakened. Uh, I mean, New York City was literally like a one giant hospital for yeah. several months. And we found that it was an incredible time for certain relationships. I mean, they were just so strengthened. Our our pod, yeah, which yeah. was two of our neighbors, my brother and his partner, my partner, our three kids. Like we, it was, I mean, game nights and, you know, drinking a little too much and telling stories and listening to music and eating and drinking, all those things. It was like, we're better, not again, horrific things happened, but we're better because of the, yeah. the, the forced nature of those few months. Yeah. How was it for you? Did you find it to be that way or? I mean, it was transformative. Like the immediately as soon as um, it really started to like sink in, I remember Adam saying, this is happening to every single person on the planet for a specific individual and collective reason. So like every single person had the test of that experience and had an opportunity in that in in how are they, they were going to move through that now granted i also acknowledge that like after that sentence i say you know i felt like we were like the luckiest people on the planet because we uh we had our health and and we had shelter and we had food and it's like to me that's almost feels like a luxury, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, on a spiritual level though, it I mean, it broke me wide open. You know, like most of my work is in person. So we were working on like filming a series and a speaking tour and all of that immediately just evaporated and went away. And so we had to like really face the uh, the decision of like how, how we were going to recalibrate in that moment and what that looked like. And, you know, our company is called At Your Service. So we had to like figure out how to be of service in that moment. And and through stories, we started our like a live series called um, AYS Hour, At Your Service Hour, where every single day I would interview um, someone about a, a way that they wanted to be of service to the community and what stories they wanted to share and how we could you know, commune during that time. Um, we also were faced with the, uh, you know, it, it just didn't make sense for us to live in the city anymore. We were in the city for a couple of years and uh, the investment of living in this city is a lot of times like of the in-person of it all. And so um, we ended up deciding to move upstate to the mountains and made the big decision of building our business and our life from there. Um, and, you know, a media company being built out of the Catskill Mountains is an interesting feat. But I realized it, I mean, it just completely shaped uh, the ethos of our work and how we navigate storytelling because it forces you to sit in silence and sit with yourself and to really be in deep contemplation and self-investigation and to spend time in nature and to unplug. Like my last investigation it's like a 10 part podcast series called rep. And I wrote 
majority of it on yellow legal pads because like I wrote it in a cabin that had no internet and it made me ask the questions I was too afraid to ask. And, you know, I didn't have my phone next to me to like distract myself by scrolling on social media. Like I just had to face the yellow pages and uh, and it worked. And I painted to do it. I danced to do it. I hugged trees to do it. And I was just like, wait a minute. If, if we can like approach telling stories from this like way where no matter what question you ask, the answers will guide you towards true interconnectedness, mm. then we're on to something. Definitely. I have so enjoyed, there's so many things I want to say there. One was thank you for doing all of those lives and having those conversations during the <laughs> pandemic. I was that. on so many of them. Thank you. As I was as I was trying to figure out how to be a storyteller and a mm -hmm. uh, justice uh, do-gooder in a pandemic where no one knew what was ahead. It was uncharted territories. Yeah. So thank you for doing that. And I was interested uh, about how life out, because you, before, in this, before you were here, you were in D.C. So you're a city, yeah. city dweller. Obviously, this is a much bigger city, but that's a significant city. It's a significant yeah. place to be. DC, yeah. Do you, what do you miss or do you not, or are you just good coming in every once in a while? Oh, yeah. gosh. I, so it's interesting because when I was living in D.C. and in Maryland, like I was regularly coming into the city anyway. And my, ex I use, I mean, I've been a, a, in love with New York City since I was a child. I was like, yeah, this is the only same. place I ever want to live. And um, and so I actually really loved like coming and visiting and hotel hopping. And, it, and, and being a visitor in this city for me is like, I am able to maximize on my experience while I'm here. Cause I'm like, I'm gonna have coffee with this person, then tea with this person, lunch with this person, and then record Nick's podcast. And then I'm gonna go to the Daily Show taping. And then I'm gonna go to my friend's Christmas party. And like, there, there's like a level of intentionality that I have in my trips. And so I, I naturally was like, I didn't know I was gonna feel this way, like moving back into like a rural area. Um, and it, granted where we live, we have an amazing town and it kind of feels like Brooklyn. So I'm yeah. not gonna lie, but um there the coming back home from a city trip and looking up and and looking at the stars and hearing the waterfall on the land and and smelling the like moss it's it is actual medicine and i as soon as we moved i actually i was diagnosed with graves disease which is like a mm. thyroid autoimmune disease but i actually just went into remission officially a couple of days ago so Congrats. i'm very thank you wow. i'm so grateful um but had I not had that space, like the health journey would have been really different. I feel like my body finally felt safe enough to like clearly give me all the messages that it was trying to give me over the last 15 years. Yep. Um, and I'm, I still am completely in love with New York City and I'm so happy to be, we come pretty like every week or every other week and hotel hop or stay with friends and it, um, I don't know. Everything is a love story these days. And I feel like I'm I'm continuing mine with New York. Yeah. I mean, it does sound so much like that. And you get the best of both worlds. I yeah. constantly am thinking about our future and what that's going to look like. Well, A, whether we'll even live in this country post-2024, depending on how things happen. Gosh, I everybody I, I know is having that conversation. It's so wild. Adam says this all the time. He's like, what are we doing here? We have family in Morocco. And it's just so wild. Because I have friends who... Um, are in the entertainment business, in the music business, in the film business, and they came here um, from a, from different countries abroad, and they're like z packed their bags and they're out. They're like, I this is not what we signed up for. We have been sold, Nor, a truckload of shit about American exceptionalism and what it means to be from here. Yep. Most of the world right now, most of my friends that live abroad, whether they live in their native place or they've expatriated. They look on us with, I feel sorry for you. Yeah. Like, you know, you, you know. We, we had an episode on rep called America's Greatest yep. Export, which explored this theory of like, is our greatest export actually our story in American yep. exceptionalism? And d while I was working on that episode, I was traveling around the country or around the world. And I like interviewed random people asking them about how they see us, like what the story mm. they have of America is. And I was just like, wow, people are pretty grossed out. Oh, yeah. It's it's really sad. I mean, just like with the gun, like with the gun problem, the mass shooting problem mm -hmm. that we have here alone. It's like I have people who live 
in war zones who will message me like saying, I was thinking of coming to university in the United States, but is it safe for me? Like and they live in a of, war zone. They live in a war zone, but they're asking if it's safe to go to school here because of the mass shootings. Yeah. So I'm like, does that mean we live in a war zone? Yeah. Which yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Do we live? Like, I mean, I think, I think the jig is up. I think for a long time, you could say this place is exceptional. And if you were ignoring all the wars that we funded, World War One, Two, all the different deserts, now it's up. Yeah. I think one of the positive things that happened as a result of the Trumpian years, yeah. he expedited the the unmasking of who we truly are. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, somebody said, well, if you go to, one of my friends the other day was like, well, if you go to Europe, um, they have shitty politicians. I'm like, yeah, I'll take shitty politics if my kids, if I never have to think about them going to school and, and getting murdered kills. or yeah. we have healthcare. I have, a, I have a friend who lives in the UK, they're trans and nine, $9 a month as a trans person for their healthcare. Wow. That's someone that needs other things yeah. that yeah. most people don't. Yeah. $9 a month. That's wild. I was like, come live here. They were like, nope, I'm, I'm staying in my little town. Yeah. In, in, in I mean, here's the, the like, I feel like this is, um, we have this kind of conversation all the time. And the question that I ask though to myself, like the way that I reframe it is I still feel, and I don't, impo this is not something I, feel like it's sure. for everybody, but I feel personally a responsibility to being of service to the people in this yep. country. I feel I it feel that. because, you know, my family left Libya to leave like a dictator who was like my dad witnessed his friends being hung in the university square for going to morning prayer. Like we there, so we come from these like places where oppression was already prevalent, dictatorship was already prevalent, free speech means something completely different to us where like people got people got killed for the things that they said. The so, there's oh there's so many things I could say about this, but I like I really don't take for the granted the fact that we um have the ability to criticize our government, but I also like in this moment in time, you know, when we're ba I, I was talking to my friend yesterday who is a children's book author. Uh, her name is Rhoda Ahmed. She has a publishing house and mm. she uh, pub she has an incredible children's book on Mae Jemison, the first black woman astronaut in NASA. And her book is banned in 42 states. That children's book is banned in 42 states. So now I'm like, w I thought like banning books was something that happened under the dictatorships that like our families came from. So it's kind of like we, this country has made a specific promise and I feel like I really do believe in it. And I am, I don't know, right now in this moment, I'm like, I just, I need to see, I need to look Americans in the eye and I want to uh, feel them and I want to sit with them and I want to uh, intentionally check in on America's spirit and who we really are, because yeah. I don't believe that the actions of our government are representative of the people here. Sure. I really, I re my great uncle said this on rep about like, he believes in the, he believes in the people and he believes in the constitution. And, and I really believe, I do believe in the people. I know that a lot of them are in pain and are hurting and are really, really not being kind right now, but I really believe in our spirit if we just learned how to like see each other as human again. Which is why we need to keep telling stories. Yeah. And inviting people to tell their stories. Yes. Right, like everybody is a storyteller waiting to happen. Mm. They're just really damaged or I mean, we, we're seeing it right now with, we won't get into this just yet. Well, if we do, fine, but with the, um, these calls for ceasefire, right? You have, no matter the party, mm -hmm. across party lines, We're across good. party lines, Republican, Democrat, Independent, yeah. over, the majority of people are like, what the hell's going on? <laughs> yeah. And why are we going along with it? Not just going along with it, not just hug, not just seeing our president, which was so just, I mean, it was, I, 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 I think I cried when I saw the picture yeah. of Trump yeah. hugging Netanyahu, yeah. like embracing. And Biden. Like, Biden. But also Biden. <laughs> that yeah. was that was a faux pas, but not really. Um, Biden. I mean, Netanyahu's head was in his like right here, where where you like hug someone that you care about. And mm. not only are we 
Right. So I, I think you said you said it. Like there, there have been promises made, and this country has not kept them. And yeah. so there's not. It's not a right or wrong. Those that expatriate totally right for you. Those that stay, you have the James Baldwins, right? Like James stayed yeah, as long as he could. My, yeah. And then he said, I, he, he said it, I think it was the night after there was a story about him in the restaurant where he was being, there was racism being enacted toward him. And he threw that, the plate at that diner, to, at that waitress. And then they chased him out. He said, if I don't leave, I'm going to kill or be killed. He was in a predicament. Wow. So he left, he went to France, Switzerland. And from there he was able to criticize in right mm-hmm. for several years for many years and then there's eddie glaude jr at princeton amazing author amazing human on the podcast was like don't leave like we mm. the more the more of the, the damn givers that leave well it just gives the others that want that seemingly want this country this experiment to fail and not deliver on its promises they get the bigger piece of the pie so it's it feels like again there's no right or wrong either way but it feels like a hard place because I want my kids to be safe. I want them to grow up in a place where college is paid for because you live here and because we care about you as a citizen, not right. here where 20 years later, people are still paying off their college loans. Yeah. And and, and a lot of people don't um, feel like it's necessary to be going anymore because it's like you're just literally putting yourself in debt to to, yeah. to get a job that, yeah, it's... Mm. It's so individual and though yep. it's like that's yep. that's why I like say that I, I say it with such caution because I'm like everybody is on their own journey and I would never be like you're doing 100%. the right thing you're doing the wrong thing but I definitely I am seeing the challenge that is being presented to people and I can't even imagine what it's like as a parent. It's tough. There's just a just a few extra things to think about <laughs> in terms of Yeah. Um, you always ask this is kind of maybe you sort of already answered it but as we get into this conversation you always ask people How's your heart? Uh-huh. And you asked me that <laughs> on a DM the other day. Mm. And I love that question. Um, how's your heart? Hmm. It's like that question brings me to tears now. I don't know how yeah. to answer it anymore. It's funny. I was um, right before I got here in the car ride, I was taught we were on a phone phone call with a friend who's an amazing film director and he reported and like documented in war zones around the world for 20 years and he had been to Gaza and he had been himself diagnosed with PTSD three times Mm -hmm. and um and he was so passionate and emotional in what he was saying to us and he mentioned that he that he's noticing his friends around him who are consuming you know, these videos of the children under the rubble and the parents carrying their their kids who have been killed by these Israeli airstrikes and just all of it, all of it, just, just witnessing and bearing witness to the worst atrocities that we've ever seen. Mm-hmm. Um, and he made a comment and he noticed, he said, I, I'm noticing... Um, signs of PTSD and my friends directly around me and how like he's he's seeing people slip into addiction and he's seeing people slip into depression and I'm just like do we not think that this is impacting every single one of us and I just my heart is like it's it's this is a word that Adam used yesterday and I carry it today is it's very solemn I am like not disbelief because mm. I'm, I believe I can believe it. And I'm just like, how did we not, ante- how do we not see this, this coming in terms of like the never acknowledging the elephant in the room and then watching the world and in humanity just go to a place that I didn't think was possible. Mm. Um, but in all of that pain, for me, the pain has been really, really intense and consistent since 9-11 of this year, actually, because on September 11th, uh, there were catastrophic floods in Derna and Libya, killed so many of our family members, and just and the city was, quote, deposited into the sea. That's like the one Literally, the photos before yeah. and after were That's how they, it was just literally the, the city was picked up and put into the ocean. 
And I felt my entire world just like, like the fog on the glass cleared up immediately. And I was looking around, I was like, nothing matters except for like keeping humanity alive, like keeping each other alive and protecting one another. And it just was such a recalibration for me. And I, I call this, I've been calling this moment for months, the great recalibration. And it, it was time. And I trace it back. It's funny because I was like, you started out this conversation talking about the pandemic. And I was like, huh, we're still talking about that. Interesting. Why? And then I remember that I believe that this recalibration, that's what, that's when like it really started. Mm -hmm. That's when we were all faced with a reality together. And like, did we think that this was just going to go away? No, like th you wouldn't be seeing the, the courage that people are carrying to be vocal about the Palestinian plight today if we didn't have Black Lives Matter in 2020 where people were just like enough is enough is enough is enough is enough. We like have to protect life and we have to protect each other and we have to see each other as humans. Like there's so many pieces of it all. Um, so my heart is solemn, but it also is fortified because, you know, even after the floods, like I went into this mode of service that I had never known was right. possible. Yeah. Like we raised hundreds of thousands of dollars, but even more so we like uh, connected people on the ground who were actually bringing aid and submarine technology to be able to like find bodies underwater, like all of these things, just from like using social media. It was like, we were in that moment, like it seemed like we were doing more than the actual government there because also like, we had to find creative ways to get the aid to people because the government was like confiscating stuff. And so it was just, it was a terrifying thing to be like, how do we have this power and this ability to actually like be of service in this way in like my ancestral city in Derna? And also like, that's so scary that the people who are supposed to protect us, those in power, Th didn't like no and not only didn't now over there they're they were arresting um people who were speaking up and asking for accountability because it was completely a man-made situation like the everybody knew that the dams there had been reports of the dams needing to be fixed for years and nobody did it and and that's what happens when the dams break but um you asked how my heart is and it's, I guess my heart is fortifying and just putting the pieces together and just one foot in front of the other because there's, that's like, that's all we have to do. It's also, my heart is very present. Like I've, I, I mm, learned that during sure, the floods, yeah. like I'd never been more present. Like every single feeling, every single day I was noticing things that I was just wasn't living in my head as much because everything was like right in front of me and around me and needed to be addressed and needed to be engaged with. And so presence has been really powerful. That's an important note because I have felt the same exact thing during a lot of different things that have happened the last few years. But right now I feel that mm -hmm. like right now because my parents are flying in tonight. They haven't been here since we moved here. We're going to have like a really great week with them. Wow. Um, I'm you're, so happy you know, for you're you. going to the Tonight Show after this. Like we have to, there's this weird thing happening where we can only do so much, but how much can we do and what more can we do? We've mm -hmm. got to keep living our lives. Yeah. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. It, yes. And it's been there. There, I ha have... It's such a weird thing. Like anytime I'm ha experiencing like a lot of joy, I immediately start seeing videos in my head or seeing oh, images yeah. and feeling it and feeling it. And, um, but yeah, you know, during the floods, like one of the things that came to me was this, I just kept hearing in my head, like, please don't forget to tell our love stories. Please don't forget to tell our love mm. stories. And like the importance of creating love stories and engaging with love stories and telling our love stories. And, and holding on to hope and choosing joy and and rest and like because at the end of the day oppressors need us in our fatigue they need us in our apathy that's, that's like when that's when the darkest that's so good. things happen so it's like if 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 you choose to just go numb and to dissociate and to leave your body then 
you're falling into the trap. You have to be here now. We yeah. have to choose to feel the things that our body is demanding us to feel and then alchemize it and then feel it and then be like, how can I use this and channel it into something? Like all of the rage and the anger and the sadness and the pain that I've been feeling for the last several months, I've literally been channeling into storytelling and work and art. And I'm, and by the way, like a, a, a way to, to do this that I have found is really engaging with art that people make in times like this. Like I started a community playlist on Spotify called The Great Recalibration. I've been listening to it nonstop. The, it's, if I do say so myself, the best playlist I've ever listened to. And that's we'll just a to testament it. to, um, I, I literally said to Adam, I was like, do you wanna know the community that we've cultivated with At Your Service? Go listen to this playlist because every single song there is, uh, was suggested by somebody. And it's just revolution, revolution, revolution. Yep. And in the most spiritual, loving, like powerful way. And I was just thinking like, you know, maybe part of the grief that we're experiencing right now and the sadness that we're experiencing right now is this realization that we will most likely never see the world that we really want to live in. Like we won't live no. to see that. Yep. But we are also living in the world that all of the revolutionaries before us didn't get to see. They, and they would never have dreamed this. No, but but we wouldn't have this without them. Yes. So sure. it's just yep. kind of like this grief where we have to let go of the outcome and we have to let go of wanting, like being like, I'm only going to do something if I'm going to see the change. I'm too small. I'm too small. I'm too, of course you're not. You're not too small because you're not just you. You are all of us. We are all connected. We are all interconnected. We need each other. Do your freaking part, man. Like sign up for your role. Yep. You know what it is. And in order to do that, you need to bear witness. You need to feel. You need to alchemize your feelings. You need to consume art. You need to witness stories. You need to tell the truth on yourself. You need to ask hard questions. You need to put everything on the line. Because otherwise, Preach. you're not living a life worth living to me. I'm like, this life is only worth living if you're going to put everything on the line to like be part of humanity. Preach. We're uh, in a church right now. We, so. are, we <laughs> are. We are in a church. <laughs> Brian Andreas's quote always comes to mind when this conversation is happening. Um, anyone can slay a dragon, try waking up every morning and loving the world all over again. That takes wow. a hero. Oh, that gave me chills. Right? Like, Anybody can slay a dragon. First of all, that statement is like, no, everybody can't. But when you think about yeah. how small slaying a dragon would be comparing to getting up this, we have maps in front of us. Yeah. And like to get up in front of this yeah. with all the stuff going on in our country, elsewhere, and keep loving this <laughs> absolute shit show of a planet that we get to live on. Yeah. That's a real hero. I just posted this clip of James Baldwin on my page and I never like post these like archival clips, but I needed, I just needed to cause I needed it for myself. And it opens with love has never been a popular movement. Yeah, And I really like, and it, he says, love has never been a popular movement and no one has ever really wanted to be free. And I was like, ouch. So powerful. Ouch. Because that would mean you holding yourself accountable. Love, like, you know, we grow up with these sayings. And I've been thinking about this so much. Like, love is the answer. Love is the answer. All we want is love. Peace, love, blah, 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 blah. All yeah, of it. Yeah. And yeah. like, we never properly defined love. We just didn't. Because love is like, is actually a revolutionary act to see the one in front of you as yourself to say that 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 is a I kept thinking about this like I I, I have been uh, talking to my friend Rupi Kaur she's an amazing poet and uh, it's been just it's been really hard and in these moments of hard I feel like the, mm. my friendships have really just gotten so much stronger love that and she was having a really hard time and I said to her you know I've I've been thinking about like I th a lot I'm sure many of you who are listening are familiar with Bisan the journalist in Gaza mm -hmm. who's been documenting every single day and. She is literally my hero. And I just had this moment where I was like, why is she there and I'm here? Like, why are why are we, and not just like me and her, but just on a globe, like why are certain people, like their lives are, ex their life experience is one that feels like so painful and ours is here and what, and I noticed in my language that that was, that even, even in my own language, I was separating us. Because like, it isn't actually until like I realized, well, 
well, it's not that I'm here and she's there. I'm also there. Like we are also, we are her. We are Matas. We are all these people. And the reason that this, this pain is also so visceral, I think for so many of us is we're also witnessing, especially if your family comes from a, a land that has been colonized and brutalized, like what happened to our families? Like I, every time I see an airstrike bring one of those buildings down and I've lost family in a U.S. airstrike, I just, I, I, literally lose words and I'm like that's what it looked like like you cannot that's what it sounded like that's what it felt like Like, it's incomprehensible and so I'm just like but oh my gosh most of the world experiences this and that's why I'm we have these conversations we're feeling all this pain but I also am like we are still like some of the luckiest most privileged people in the entire world and so there is no excuse. There's no excuse for us to not be a part of the like collective healing and liberation of all people. Like we have that responsibility. We do. That's why Let's Give a Damn exists. And I'm so grateful for your work. I really, really am. Can you tell us a story based on, you know, you just talked about you have family members that (laughs) died in an airstrike. You have this amazing series, audio series called Rep. Yeah. I've listened to it. I re-listened to a couple in preparation for this, just thinking about your work. Mm, Um, Thank you. First episode, last episode, incredible bookends to this story. (laughs) Thanks for noticing. And I love, um, the story I want you to tell is the Harvard talk. Oh my God. Yeah. Because you just referenced it. And I want you to to say what happened to your family members and then bring it fast forward it you know to your series we'll link to those episodes and to i think you i think one of your pinned posts is yeah it is that video is that, is that, that video. video i was like no, i will never be able to post anything ever in my entire life that was as powerful as that i mean <laughs> lich, i'm on the train coming here listening to that part of the episode and i was just like holy shit like yeah that was a real thing that happened so tell that me, story it took me like months to like process that, that experience yeah so in 1986, the U.S. was conducting airstrikes in Tripoli, Libya, uh, in an attempt to assassinate the dictator at the time, Amr Gaddafi. And um, fun fact that I report on also, if for context of what's happening in pop culture, is that nine months earlier, Back to the Future comes out. It's this huge blockbuster hit. And the opening scene of Back to the Future are these like barbaric Libyan terrorists who like speak like that. That's how they sound. And Doc and Marty are running from them. And so this is like the the only Libyan representation on um, in pop culture at that time. And honestly, maybe, I don't know. I haven't seen anything since. So um, anyway, so that happens. So nine months later, airstrikes and uh, they do not, they end up hitting a civilian apartment complex um, that housed five of my family members. Um, and my great uncle at the time was in Oklahoma at his son's baseball game. And he was like a news junkie still is. And he was watching on his two inch TV that he had gotten from New York city on one trip. Um, he was watching the news and he heard on a press conference that they had, uh, they had bombed in Libya and they had mentioned that it was, near like the French embassy and my great uncle ran home because that embassy shares a wall with our family's building. And he called, it was in the middle of the night in Libya at the time he called his sister and said, have you heard from the family or whatever, his sister who lived a mile down from there. And she said, no, all of the glass in the house has just shattered. Like um, it woke them up basically. And when she said that the glass had shattered and they heard that he said, I, then I think our family has vanished. He used that language. Mm -hmm. And, um, and yeah, they, they went, they ended up going to the site. Um, there's like an image that we don't have it in the podcast, but every single person who tells this story talks about, and they, I mean, obviously there's still a lot of trauma around it, but they had to like pick, pick up, they had to gather the pieces of their family members' bodies and like, somebody has like this memory of like picking up the face of one of our uncles. And it's just like, you can't even imagine. Um, there was also a child who was like in our family who was staying over, sleeping over her grandparents' house because she was doing homework late. 
So it's just like all these like human stories. Um, so that is how we we open the epi- the series of rep talking about this story because the question that I'm asking is how has the way that Muslims and Arabs have been represented in American media impacted our culture and society as a whole. And I wanted to really take accountability for my own role in this. Mm. And so I was like, I'm gonna start with my own stories that I haven't fully investigated. Um, And so I start with the story of my family, the story that I had heard of, but I didn't put all the puzzle pieces together. And so I started going through archival footage, watching like the Phil Donahue episode where they talk about the airstrike and Americans are sharing visceral reactions to it from all, like with all different perspectives and um, the back to the future scene and all of that. So actually, so fast forward to a week after the episode drops and I'm speaking at Harvard University. And it's funny because I actually had gotten invited to two events at Harvard at the same, on the same day. And I was, I was going to say no to both, but Adam, uh, my partner in life and in business insisted that I go (laughs) to one. And one of the events, when she found out I was invited to speak at this specific forum, she was like, don't even come to ours. You have to go to that one. It's like really amazing. Mm. Mm. I was like, okay, cool. And so I went And uh, I shared about the story with my family. Um, And during the Q&A, this older woman with like white hair and glasses on the top of her head and a pen and paper, which clearly she's taking notes. She gets up um, to ask a question and her voice is shaking. And she asks to confirm, like, am I talking about the bombing in Tripoli? And I say, yes. And then she just like blurts out, I stood in that house the day after the bombing. And I just was, I, I think I was just like, what? Well, yeah, because you're like, wait, not that house, like Like another house. Like, what are you, I I couldn't, it was live and you can hear people gasp in the room. The entire front row is Adam's entire family actually. And they've never come to any of my events altogether. And like, like a speaking event and they're all there. And surprisingly, my whole family in Mar- like that, my family that this happened to is all watching this live stream at home, which is wild because like, that's so random for them to watch a live stream of like one of my talks. But this one, for some reason, they all gathered around to. So they all, my mom, they were, they all broke into tears immediately too. And and we had this like huge moment. And yeah. So I connect with this woman afterwards. Her name's Barb. And she tells me that she wasn't even supposed to be at the event, that her husband um, was doing like this fellowship. They're, her and her husband are very like um, like profound journalists. They worked for the Wall Street Journal. And um, that was their last day. And they were going to move back to where they lived, which was Maryland, which is where my family is. Right. So I was like, what is happening? So then uh, we ended up, arranging for in a couple of weeks after that for her to meet my whole family because she was my age at the time in Libya reporting it and she was saying that they had to fight to report on that story because the U.S. government didn't want them to report on civilian deaths and until now if you were to look it up it doesn't say anything about civilian casualties so like that's why we never knew like how many people died like an accurate number of how many people died. I always in my head just assumed it was our family, but I guess like just growing up because it happened to us, but I never thought about everybody else. And so she went and dug through her archives and she found that she reported that it was about a hundred people who died. And um, so she brought all of these articles to my family and, and my family pulled out all of their articles and photos. And we started piecing together like the pieces of our puzzle and then had a conversation about objectivity and truth and, it was so profound. I mean, it is still, to, it changed my life. And that was literally like right after the first episode of the series happened. So came out and I didn't realize I was going to be our finale actually, because the first episode is called Vanish and the last episode is called Alive because our stories are alive. Yep. And uh, I just knew I was like, it took me so long to process what happened that I couldn't bring myself to share a video of it because I was still watching the video and then crying. Like it was so intense. And then it brought up a lot of feelings in like my family and and family members in Libya who ended up watching it, who like, 
it was really painful for them because it's like, you know, at the end of the day, we're also still here. Like they were the ones who were picking up the pieces yeah. of our family's bodies. And they're the ones who are still suffering from that image and who directly like lost so much. So yeah, I mean, it's as soon as you start to investigate your own history, as soon as you start to ask questions about who you are and why you're alive, the the universe really has a, has a, has a profound way of bringing those stories to your doorstep. You don't have to really do much except for be really, really open. Listener, go listen to <laughs> Rep. I will link to it. It's really, really, really incredible. Um, what you said was, you said something that really caught my attention, that this Barb, this journalist, 29 at the time, yeah, because um, this is the mid 80s, uh, late 80s, uh, there's no social media, no cell phones, yeah. no anything, right? So we're, we're seeing a, a different thing happening right now, which I don't know which one I prefer for my own. No, I, I, I do need to see it. We do need to see it. You yeah. know, they didn't know for a long time how many civilians. Israel can't hide. Yeah. The 100%. amount, the, the, num, the, the, the evil number of people that are being slaughtered right now, because everybody's got these, not just the amazing journalists, um, what's her name? You mentioned, I've, I've been following her as well. The journalist. You mentioned. Yep. And Mota. Like but also by the way, and just to like make a note, yeah. I am realizing that it is also kind of like impossible to be able to fully account when there's so many people who are under the rubble, but cause like even when the Libya floods happened and they were trying to count the bodies, but the bodies were all underwater and they were decomposing underwater. Like I just remember seeing this one man's face cause they're, they're, these people are doing everything by hand, you know, like there's, it's impossible. And it was just like 100%. an impossible task to like fully document that. So like, even then it's like the numbers are always underreported because you're only counting the ones that you like for sure have seen. Yes. The U S government and Israel are saying that the numbers that are being reported oh. are way under. And I've always said, no, no, they're way over. They're way like, over. Like we have yet, because here, if that happened here, everybody's got a license. Everybody's been identified at their school. That's not, in a, they've been in an open air concentration camp for well, it's, right like you, it's literally people under rubble like you you just it's it, they don't even know yet yeah you they don't there's no machinery that's like these are people with their bare hands pulling people out so we have it's yeah the it's so layered but um yeah good wow. god um okay we are both people of faith yeah what is your faith tradition christian reluctantly Christian. Um, I am cool. Anglo Catholic. Oh. So I'm this is the church that we're in is sort of my You would thing. so you would attend here? Yes. Oh nice. I, have. I love it. I've been attending different services of different faith traditions. I'm yeah. like very into that right now. Yeah, I've tried actually I'm a little I should be I don't know if I should say this on here, but I should be uh ordained as an Anglican priest in a few months. What? I've been yeah, I've been No way. Yeah, I've been switch I've been ordained uh, in a different Christian tradition that is very regressive and not just the, yeah, not even near progressive. And so I have to leave them because they stand for things that I just don't. Oh, that's a whole conversation I would like yes. to have with you, but well, also yeah. congrats. That's amazing. Thanks. I'm so happy for you. It's been kind of a wild journey because I'm obviously this person that's known for being very like, very loud. Um, I use cuss words very frequently. I'm, I'm just, a, I'm, I'm very real. Like I am who I am, but there's still a part of me that Again, going back to the, do we leave the U.S. or stay because there's good here, right? It's the same thing with religion. Like so many of my friends have left it all together. And I'm like, again, there's no wrong here. So I'm like, as a universalist who believes that all of us were all I feel that. searching for the same thing, I'm like, go, seriously, leave Everyone the faith. Everyone has their own journey. Everyone yes. has their own path, dude. But for me, I have not been able to leave it. It's been kind of a weird thing. And so how, yeah, what's the faith journey been as we wrap up here? What's the faith journey been the last, like, because again, we met yeah. in 2017, six months, seven months into Trump presidency. Uh, a lot, a lot has happened since then. Yeah. A lot of things that should have pushed people maybe closer, but probably further away. Like, it's just, there's so much happening in the faith world. Yeah. Is your faith stronger now? Uh, That's a great question. That's now? a great question. Even it's a even... great question because the context of what you're saying is actually um, <laughs> the first thing that pops into my head is well, I guess it depends on who you ask. Because for me, 
I feel like my faith is stronger than it's ever, 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 ever been. And I've also redefined what the word faith means to me. And also because a lot of people, not a lot, I shouldn't say a lot, a couple of people that I really love would say, would say that they think my faith is weaker. Right. Because obviously. Same here, yeah. I, well, yeah. I, well, yes, for me, it's like because I don't cover my hair anymore. And yep. obviously the last time I saw you, I was covering my hair. And so for a lot of people, because I'm not covering my hair anymore, they feel like my faith is weaker. And my, I, and that's fine. That belief, if that is how you feel and you have to contend with that, that is none of my business. However, for me, I feel like my faith is so much stronger because to me, faith is trust in the unknown. Mm. And I have so much trust in the unknown. It's why I was able to, even when it terrified me, ask some of the hardest questions I've ever asked in my life. And I, my relationship with God is I like, I'm like, hey, God, I will never, ever, ever do anything like for you that I don't fully, fully, fully believe in and understand and all of that. And for me, that journey has been, uh, and I feel God back be like, absolutely, because that's what faith is. Like, why would you do something out of fear? You have to do something because you have conviction in it and you believe in it and all of that. And, um, and so I have been challenging myself around faith and like really building a relationship with God and being in communication with the divine and also fully surrendering to the process and, and fully listening to like what my inner voice is telling me, what my intuition is guiding me to and being like, Hey, I, I have a question about this. There's a little itch about this. I want to dig a little bit more here. And I don't really have all the answers for this. So that means I need to step back and I need to like look at this from a more objective standpoint, or um, maybe like this is where my heart is guiding. It's just been so, I've, I feel like I've been flowing like water, mm -hmm. but the noise yeah. around has been like really, really loud, but I've been able to dial it down because I realize that the noise that people like and their reactions and what they have to say and their, their beliefs that they want to impose on me and whatever, and the stories that they write about me, even though they're, completely untrue because those are stories of your own projections. You don't actually know my heart and you don't know. And also if people don't have the, uh, the courage to just ask and they just want to assume, then that is totally on you. Yes. Um, so my relationship with faith is just, I really feel it's been so, 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 so strong and so expansive. And it's funny because we're working on a different show right now we're continuing rep but in a very different way like we're 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 facilitating a tour like a rep tour and doing town halls in different communities mm, to like that. bring people together love to that. have the hard conversations um but we're doing that obviously it feels very important to do that right now but the bigger story and the bigger story that i've really been wanting to work on that i think i'm working on but for myself without it being documented until it's time is investigating the state of America's spirit and spirituality and faith, because I, I feel it is really important to be asking people like, what do you believe and yeah. why do you believe it? And have you, have you investigated your own beliefs? Because at this point, if you're just, and, and by the way, this is also like investigating your beliefs is actually a part of the Muslim tradition. So I'm also tapping back into what the actual tradition feels like and not what people's projections of it are, especially when you, you're, a lot of times the projections are a politicized version of the tradition. And unfortunately, when you have like, when you're Muslim America and a post 9-11 America, like a lot of your time around faith is, it, 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 for, it, sometimes you're forced to like defend your faith and defend your beliefs and like constantly be in reaction to like people's projections instead of really going inward. And for me, I'm like, I'm good on that. I would like to go inward and build a relationship with this because I, while my journey, my faith journey, as public as it has been for all of these years, and I was so, as, as soon as it didn't feel true to me to like be talking out loud about it all the time, which by the way, is completely a result of rep. Like mm -hmm. rep broke me open because it was how I realized that my own internalization of my faith has been politicized too because of the world, like because of the country that we live in. And I wanted to take it back for myself and be like, okay, what are the questions that I actually have? What are the things that like, I don't fully understand. And 
I'm not rushing for those answers. I'm not even looking for answers that end in a period. I'm just sitting with the questions that arise and I'm so grateful that I'm that I'm giving myself the opportunity to do that because that to me is like what it's all about. It's I I I believe in the divine and I feel it so I feel surrounded and covered Same. in that light so deeply and I also with my entire being like truly believe that there is no one way. Mm -hmm. I really think that everybody there are diff an infinite number of paths yeah. that get you to this like divine connection that we're all looking for. And instead of just sitting there and trying to like shove your way down someone's throat, what are you doing to give a people around you the space to explore and investigate without your fear? Because fear is for me, I don't choose the lane of fear. I choose the lane of love. And yeah. that comes back to what we were saying about love has never been a popular movement. But it has, to me, been the most transformative one. And if I keep going back to that, then like I feel like I'm good. The greatest gift that my faith journey has given me is the ability to ask questions and not know. 100%. And to stop in the tradition I grew up in, it was proselytize, proselytize. Get exactly. Them, get them on exactly. your team. Yeah. I have, I'm raising my kids to not do that. You know what I'm telling them? Do love, be kind, like hug be people, love, prevent, period. be love, yeah. period. Yeah. yeah, I love that. It's so It's so important because then they cultivate their relationship with the divine in a truly fruitful way. Like, I really believe that. Then they're not having to like undo, well, is this like, is is this all what I believe because like my dad told me to or because I believe, whatever. It's like, I, I really believe in teaching people to ask questions. And I yeah. think that what I'm noticing is that people have a really hard time asking themselves the hard questions. Um, but once we move past the fear, I, I wrote this recently. I wrote a guide on how to ask yourself hard questions. Mm. It's not published yet, but I wrote, fear will always meet you at the gates of freedom. And I really believe that fear will meet you at the gates of freedom. But once you move through that fear and you let it move through your body, then you you can be free to actually ask. And when once you are on the journey of asking, that's how moments like what happened at Harvard happened. And honestly, that moment changed my life and also... I've had hundreds of moments like that ever since. It's kind of wild. I I really believe that like just life is so miraculous and and one when you create the space of openness and natural curiosity and wonder, the stories will find their way to your doorstep because you welcomed them. I could talk to you for hours. Not this time. We'll do it again. We'll do round Happy three. Happy to at do some it point. anytime. Yeah. Let me end by honoring you by telling oh, a quick story. Oh wow. So I recently heard um this story, uh, Jeff Wilco told this story, sorry, Jeff Tweedy from Wilco told this story uh, about back 9-11, his son was six and he picked him up from school like many parents did on that day and their kids didn't know what the hell was going on. And a lot of parents had conversations with each other and with their kids that day about like what was happening, right, in real time. Mm -hmm. And he sits his kid down, talks through everything that he had heard, gives him more details, whatever, and then says, what do you think about that? Like, what do you think about what's going on? And the six-year-old kid, Jeff Tweedy's son, says, everything in the world breaks. And well, Jeff thought, okay, that's a big that's a big statement. Do you think that's, hey, buddy, do you think that's a good or a bad thing? And the kid sits there and thinks for a minute and says, I think it's a good thing. Because if everything didn't break, bad things would last forever. A, wherever that six-year-old kid is now, 20-something years later, that wisdom as a six-year-old, yeah. if everything didn't break, bad things would last forever. Things have to break. This world is not perfect. Mm -hmm. It's not, it, it's, it's so, so much of it is so bad. And we experience that bad all around us and we're seeing it. And uh, your name means light, right? Yeah, Nur al-Huda. I mean, it, technically my full name, Nur al-Huda, means the guiding light. The guiding light. That's even better. So as everything breaks... And the bad things hopefully stay broken and the good things get repaired. Um, thank you for being a guiding light for me and for all of us and for so many. You're such a, an incredible human, thank a great you. teacher, a great guide, great storyteller. And I hope uh, we can keep being friends and doing stuff for a long time to come. Thank you for giving a damn. I'm really proud of you, dude. Thanks. You, you've like, you really have been such a real one. And we're so, I felt it. I felt it in my body. I was like, I need to sit down with Nick. Mm. I was like, we, to be honest with you, we haven't been like doing interviews recently and just wanting to just kind of marinate a little bit. And you've, you're, I really see that you are such a light and you're such a like 
gatherer and you're great at what you do. I appreciate you. you, my friend. Thank you.